my name is Noel Crawford. Uh, I'm um, a great grand nephew of uh, Michael Mallon. Uh, there are other people in the audience with us today, I'm glad to say, uh, who are far closer relations to Michael Mallon. We have Michael's granddaughter, Una, here, sitting up here, and uh, I'm sure she'll chat to anybody that wants at the end. And uh, Sean Taffy. Sean, I'm not sure of the grand exact grandnephew. Yeah. So I'm great. Great, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the young pleasure. <laughs> So, um, okay, what, what, what I'm going to talk about is a perspective of Michael Mallon from my perspective. It might not even be the perspective that other members of the extended family have. This is my perspective of the Michael Mallon that I, I love as a patriot and as a, a great grand uncle that I met, never met. Okay? So, I'm not saying the dates, times, everything is completely accurate and what I put up here. I just found out one thing that I was told by another historian was a fact that I found out isn't a fact because the man's daughter is here to tell me no, that that wasn't a fact. So, and there's some controversial issues in Michael's life as well that we'll touch on and maybe have a discussion about because uh, John has views on about stuff that I'm not aware of. He's done more research in, in the areas of controversies. Um, there are a couple of other controversies that may challenge people as well uh, that we'll touch on. But remember, I'm not giving you a political view, I'm just giving you my own view. Right? So I'm, I'm kind of apolitical. I don't support any political parties. Um, I'm, uh, my own background in education is uh, I have an MA in business and IT, and uh, I'm qualified in archaeology as well, so I have a range of interests. And um, the archaeology stuff, I'm, and I have an interest in ancient Greece and Rome as well, is very nice around uh, Michael Mallon because Michael Mallon's big interests outside trade unionism and revolutionary politics or ancient history and, um, and, and English literature. Uh, there was a couple of writers in particular he was very interested in, which is very revealing, you know, uh, uh, Joseph Conrad, uh, Heart of Darkness, and uh, Lord Jim. So uh, there's a little, couple of things I've come across in my research for today that kind of show me why he might have been interested in, in Conrad's books, uh, you know, the, uh, the comparison between uh, corruption on the one hand and beauty on the other hand, and how close two of them can be. That's a reference to the butterfly on the pile of uh, elephant dung uh, that's given in, in Lord Jim. And I do think that the, the novels of Conrad are based very much on adventure. I think people, when they read them first, uh, especially men, are interested in the adventure, and then when you read them for the second time, you see what the novels are really about. And that, I think, is very uh, revealing about, about Michael as well. And there's a couple of things I came across in the research and the books I did uh, on the books that, that show the adventurous side of Michael as well. So, let's move on. And please, if, if people have an issue with anything I say, that's fair enough. Um, you know, these are my own views. So, uh, Michael was obviously born. I meant to put in the year, 1874. Uh, <laughs> put that in. Um, and what I just found out today, and uh, uh, I got a lump in my throat the minute it was said to me, literally five minutes ago, and I didn't know Michael was a twin, and I don't think anybody else in the family really knew this. Una may have known. Uh, Sean just told me. Uh, Michael was a twin. I didn't know that. His sister's name was? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, and she died at birth. So uh, that would have been quite common at that time, of course, um, in tenement living. Uh, uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of circumstances where a lot of children died young. Uh, and at that time, of course, we had the worst tenements in, in Europe. Uh, probably a lot worse than a lot of places, uh, the really bad places you can think of in the world at the moment, and very high infant mortality rates. So it's not surprising, but it was a bit of a shock to me because I, I didn't know. It's the first time I heard. Um, his father was a carpenter and a boat right? and we tell a story on our side of the family, my uncle Noel tells it, about a boat that he actually built uh, that suddenly sank one day. I don't have all the details, uh, and when we meet Noel, you can get that from him, but it was apparently a boat that, uh, that, that Michael's father built. Um, so that would be your great grandfather. Uh, he attended Denmark Street National School. I have no detail on how long he stayed in national school. Uh, what, what's been handed down to me, uh, to the family, is that he joined the British Army at 14 years old. That may or may not be true. I've heard, I've read, I've read elsewhere it was 16 years old. 16 seems old for me because I know was a drummer boy, but Sean Rowley, you may not I think it was just a little bit less than 14. A little bit less than 14. So there you go. Yeah, so that would tell you what. Yeah. He's a month short of his 15th birthday. He was 14. Oh, was he? Yeah. Yeah. A month short of his 15th birthday. Short okay. Of his 15th birthday. So it just shows the inaccuracies, and we'll come back to that the inaccuracies that can be in alleged history books. Uh, he was a month short of his 15th birthday. I read a book this morning that said he was 16 when he signed up. So he was actually 14. Um, I, I know he spent the initial part uh, of his military career uh, down in the Curragh, and um, he signed up as a drawer boy, 
and was then later promoted to drummer. So um, he was also he served in India on the Northwest Frontier. Uh, talking about that a minute as well. Um, but at that time, he was three years out of four. He was the best shot in the company, and he won a prize. I think it was one pound seven shillings and sixpence for being the best shot. Uh, he was also he also learned a lot about discipline in the British Army. Uh, which is based on the discipline that was in the Roman army, and that carries all the way through to the present day, which is very interesting because he was a disciplinarian, even though he was quite a quiet and unassuming man. Uh, he fought in the Tira campaign of 1897 uh, to, to 99. He was out on campaign, he became ill on that campaign, he contracted malaria. Um, we're talking about the northwest frontier here of the area that's now Pakistan, bordering into Afghanistan. Um, I have some photographs here of that campaign. Uh, a really tough campaign. That's not to say, though, that there weren't aspects of it that he didn't enjoy. Um, he became quite disillusioned uh, with the colonial campaigns of the British Army because of what he saw, uh, what he saw of the suffering of the local people and the tribes in that area. Um, and that, that becomes obvious in some of his letters home that uh, you know. Um, and he wished he was doing it for other reasons, the fighting that he was doing. No, yes. no, no. all those letters still exist, because I have them all. But there you go. Yeah. So, uh, and, 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 and that he wrote over the years. Yeah, I'll have to get copies. I, I'm going from the ones, yeah. right, that there's excerpts in some of the books that are researched, and, uh, and what I've been told, obviously, in the family. Yeah, that, that it's, it's quite true, isn't it, in it, that he was disillusioned with what was going on out there. Yeah. Um, so he came home, then he married Agnes, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, this is, I, I like this picture because it shows a musician, a bugler obviously, uh, in the British Army on campaign in the Terror campaign. Um, I used that picture because Michael was a musician. He learned to play the flute while in the Army and, and did so very well. He used to play at dances, officer dances, and, and enjoyed that very much. Um, but it was, the campaign itself was quite tough. And if you can, actually I used this one as well because of the, uh, he was in the, the Royal Scots Fusiliers and a cap badge over there from the, an original cap badge from the Royal Scots Fusiliers. It, it's not Michael's as far as I know, though it could be, who knows, you know. Uh, my father-in-law got that for me. Um, this is the Scots Regiment, obviously, I'm not, I couldn't tell you if it's the Royal Scots Fusiliers, but they're wearing kills, so I picked that picture because of that reason. Um, you can see them out in this countryside that they were operating in. There would have been intense heat in the winter, intense cold. Uh, so a very tough campaign. That's another example of the, uh, the type of countryside that they were they were uh, working in. Very, very harsh terrain. They lived under tents while they were out there, very low tents. You weren't going to spend any time in them except to sleep. Uh, so a very, very rough time, and especially when you're ill. So we talked about Joseph Conrad and the uh, the adventuring you know aspect. So Michael was a, a youngish man, uh, even at this stage. Um, so you know, one of his quotes, uh, I'd like to be back on the front. This is when he came back from the campaign and was back in camp. Uh, and he was talking about the boredom. And he was saying, I'd like to be back on the front here. The danger of having your head blown off made it nice and exciting. Here it's too safe and easy. So he probably enjoyed his time before he went on campaign. When he went on campaign and experienced the excitement of combat, which a, a lot of soldiers uh, uh, come back and say the same thing. But even though it was terrifying, they miss it. They miss the adrenaline rush. They miss the fun they had out there, the comradeship. Um, so he missed that when he came back to camp into this very regimented life. So starting to get bored and also again he was ill. He had mounting anti-imperialism. Um, uh, this is taken from the sentence and said, you know, he, he'd rather basically that it was for Aaron that I was fighting and not against these poor people. So that's very indicative of the fact that he had huge sympathy um, for the local people that they were actually suppressing. I mean the, the Tira campaign was about uh, people just being absolutely browned off uh, of being ruled by an overlord uh, and wanting to you know, define their own future um, and not to have the fruits of their labour go to pay for uh, um, you know, uh, the companies that basically ran the empire of their private companies. So, uh, there's a story told in the family. This is, I'm also referencing John Brennan in and around 1930. I have the book over here in Kerry's Fighting Story. He, he, he wrote pen pictures, if you like, of all the executed leaders. So uh, the story is in, in the 1930, I think it was the first edition of 1930, that book, which I have there. And Brian Hughes' book all, also, mentions, uh, also mentions this story. Uh, some of the things in Brian Hughes' book are, are controversial. John, we can yeah. back there. Uh, but, but this story to me isn't controversial. It, 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 summarized, it sums up Michael a lot for me. Uh, and this was, I was also told a story as a child in the 1960s about Michael. 
uh, there was um, an incident, and it, it, the incident actually happened, I think there was an attempt on the life of the Viceroy of India, I think that that was the background, and 13 or 14 uh, Indians were arrested. Um, now, it was more, from what I can understand, it was a case of round up the usual suspects, bring them in, with a bringing in army witnesses, and, you know, we'll have a trial, a court martial, whatever it was. So they brought in 12 or 13 army witnesses, of which Michael was one. Uh, all of those witnesses, bar Michael, swore blind that these were the people uh, that attempted uh, to kill the Viceroy. Except Michael, he said, no, I don't recognise these people. Um, so he had an innate, innate sense of justice, he wasn't just going to go along with it. Uh, now, the bit of the story that, that's a little bit controversial, all that's pretty much true. The bit of the story at the end that, uh, that I, I find myself a struggle to believe, I don't know if it happened or not, and there isn't any direct evidence, I don't believe, but all of the other witnesses uh, were, were murdered uh, by, uh, by, by whatever uh, people were, were behind the actual assassination as revenge for having the, uh, the people who were on trial home. They were all home, uh, people that were brought up. So but Michael was spared and untouched. Uh, now that last bit about him, uh, that, that revenge, the revenge on the false witnesses, I'm not sure, but it, it is known that Michael did bear proper witness and denied that they were the people involved. So that again kind of illustrates the fact that, you know, he wouldn't go along with the story. Um, he told it as he saw it, and he wasn't going to bear false witness against anybody. Now that's not to say some of those people weren't involved, I don't know, but he said what he thought. I think that's very indicative of the man. So he did then come home, and, um, and became involved with, uh, with a lot of uh, left-wing politics at the time. I don't think they would have been described as vastly left-wing. He was just interested in the rights of workers, in his own rights, to go out and earn proper living. And you can see also by the next picture that by this stage he was an older, more mature person. Uh, you can see it in his eyes. I, I often think in this picture, which was taken after he came home, that uh, you can see the haggardness of a relatively young man having been through what he'd been through in India, and being ill and lost weight. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite a, a human ph photograph. He's got quite sunken eyes. His face is quite thin. Um, and you can see, I, I often, it speaks to me that he's been through a lot. Uh, as well as that, the family that he married into, and we were just talking about this a little bit earlier, about marrying into Republican families or political families, which I did, you know, and, and what which many, many of the families do. Um, he married into the family of, of Joseph Hickey. So this is a memorial stone to Joseph Hickey that just happens by coincidence. I didn't know when I was buying my house. It's right next door uh, to my house in St. Mary's Churchyard in Clonsilla. Um, and I'll, I'll come back there as well because Agnes is also buried there as is, as is Maura. Um, so I'm not sure if Joseph was actually buried in the, the graveyard, but this is a memorial stone to him. And you can see Joseph Hickey Fenian. Um, and obviously, there was, there was this interaction going on between the Republican and Fenian family. They would meet each other through whatever agencies they're involved in or whatever societies they're involved in, like Kevin. People meet each other through these things of like mind. And uh, he was obviously influenced at some stage by Joseph also. So Joseph as a Fenian would have been a, uh, you know, a, a revolutionary uh, nationalist. So he, he took an apprenticeship as a silk weaver uh, with Atkinson's. Um, I'm not sure what year that was, I'm sure somebody here knows, but he started when he came back, uh, got out of the army, uh, and he took that apprenticeship. He actually got very interested then in uh, the rights of the workers that he was working with, got involved in, in union activism, and he actually became head of the, the Silk Weavers Union. And you've got to remember that the background to all this was, uh, you know, uh, the, the lockouts, the period leading up to the lockouts, uh, really, it was a, a ter if you were a worker and weren't one of the bosses, uh, it was a terrible life. And if you've read Strumpet City, you know what life was like at the time. Now, he was no different, so he wanted to get involved and help out with this. He led the strike in 1913 at Atkinson's. It was a very successful strike. Um, you know, they, they gained their objectives, but of course, the bosses, as always, get their revenge, and he did eventually lose his job there quite soon afterwards, which is very tough for him. But because he became head of the the, uh, the Union, he had a place to live because he moved into the Union Hall in, um, in Emma Road, in Inchicore, uh, where there's now a plaque in his memory, I believe. And is that right? Were you at that? The unveiling of the plaque? So um, he then moved to a leadership position 
Uh, Captain Jack White was more or less the military commander of the Citizen Army after it was formed. It was formed after the, the, the so-called riots in, in Dublin, which were protests that were attacked by the Dublin Metropolitan Police. There's a, a nice photograph among those books of the police actually attacking the, the protesters. Not a nice photograph, but a good photograph, let's say. Um, and the Citizen's Army was formed, as you all know, to, to protect the workers from then onwards. It's a lot easier to, or a lot harder to attack people with a baton when they have a rifle pointed at you. I think that was the general view. Uh, I think there was also a general view within Dublin Castle at the time that uh, we won't be able to take the rifles off these people uh, because um, it'll cause issues and may cause the, the populace to turn against us, and uh, as happened later on, you know, that, that's exactly what did happen after the rising. So they were able to keep the rifles, they were able to uh, parade in public with them, and they were in touch for a time. Um, he also at that time took a job teaching drumming to the officer training corps in Trinity, which seems like a contradiction to find out the actual reason he actually did it was he was hoping to find where they kept the rifles. Um, he was quite successful in obtaining rifles for the citizens' army uh, from various different sources. Uh, they would buy them off soldiers, and, and this was the same for uh, the Republican volunteer movement at the time. They were doing the same thing, they were buying rifles off soldiers, they were smuggling them in at small quantities, and that's the kind of thing that the, the lads at the time would have been up to in the citizen army. Um, I want to tell the story about the train story. Uh, I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware of this story. Michael was a really strict disciplinarian. He took over from Captain Jack White. There's a lot of circumstances around that takeover. They're covered in a book by a friend of Kevin's, actually. The last time I spoke in here, that book was being launched. But let's take it from the time that Michael took over, uh, and we leave Captain White to one side. Um, he learned his discipline, obviously, in the British Army. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, at the time, there was a lot of militarism around Europe. And it wasn't just militarism about let's go spill our blood, you know, there was that all right. But there was also, but the whole concept of militarism was, was manly and was attractive and, you know, every aspect of it. So how good your uniform looked, how well you marched. And it wasn't just great to say, well, we're a great marching company. They actually have competitions. So, you know, the Irish volunteers, or the national volunteers, I can't remember when they changed the name, uh, was after the, uh, the Redmondite split anyway. But the volunteers, let's call them at the time, uh, were very proud of the way they marched. So were the, the, the National Foresters, and so were the, the, the Citizen Army. And they'd go off down on the train down the country, and they'd have uh, marching competitions. One of these particular days, uh, they marched up to Houston Station. Uh, they, they were armed, uh, and they wanted to get on the train. And the train driver, who would have been, a, for want of a better word, a West Brit, uh, decided that he wasn't going to let them on his train. He wasn't going to pull out of the station with armed men on his train who weren't British soldiers. Uh, and the story goes that uh, Michael took his pistol and walked up to the, the driver of the train and put it to his head and said, you are, you are going to take the steps on the train, which he promptly did. Uh, and that, that story is uh, also recorded within the, uh, the books, the Carryman books, Dublin's Fighting Story, and uh, with the IRA on the Red Path of Glory, which is part of the same series. Uh, it's recorded in one of those two books, which I have, and that's where I got the story from. I'm not sure if any of the other family members heard that story before. Just heard of it, just yeah. mention of it. Yeah, of. so he was. But uh, I thought there was some event where somebody got uh, killed on a train accident. Uh, no. um, maybe it was the driver. I don't no, <laughs> yeah. no, I think it was an accident, a genuine accident. Right. And yeah. There was some issue over that too. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'm not aware of that story, so there's another thing I'm not aware of. There's, there's a lot about Michael's life. I mean, you can get the high points of somebody's life and the main points. But what about all the fillers in between? What was he doing the rest of the time? There's so much we just don't know. Uh, some people have some parts of the story, other people have other parts of the story, and getting it all together. And quite frankly, the books that have come out on him um, don't do him justice, uh, I think it's fair to say. So, uh, this is the controversial piece. Did he have advanced knowledge of the rising? So within the family, there's a strong belief, and within a lot of historical sources, there's a strong belief that he actually didn't. That, uh, you know, he was the same as everybody else. He was told, get out on this day, we're going for manoeuvres, and it was the rise. Fair enough. Um, there's another school of thought that says, well, when Connolly disappeared and was taken into the confidence of the, uh, of the Republicans at the time of Pierce, uh, that the rising was planned for a certain date, and he was afraid that the Citizens' Army were going to take off before that on their own um, and steal the thunder of the volunteers. Uh, there is a school of thought that says that uh, Michael wanted to go rescuing, rescue him, this is, you know, t typical of Irish revolutionary politics. You know, the first thing on the agenda is the split. So he was willing to go and, and physically remove Connolly from the clutches of the volunteers till he got a message that said, no, it's okay, I'm fine, don't do anything. Now, so the question has to be asked, did, did Connolly come out of that, come back to Michael, who, who was basically the military commander at this stage, 
uh, he was Chief of Staff of the Citizen Army, um, did Connolly come back and say, look, it's okay, there's going to be a rising, here's what we're going to do, or did Connolly uh, keep it to himself as he was asked to do by the volunteers and didn't say it? So that's the big question, because that becomes important <coughs> later on in the court martial discussion, and I know Sean... Sean no, just to yeah. one point, I don't think that's yeah. an issue. Yeah. I don't think that, I don't know where that, that point comes from now, advance yeah. the rising, because as far as I yeah. can say, he had advanced the rising, his, his own son, James, your mm -hmm. father, your father was in Liberty Hall before yeah. the rising. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It was clearly he had uh, he prepared for it. He made his wife some yeah. uh, stuff to, to sell and stuff like that. So. So. I don't think so there's any issue about the advanced but knowledge. The date and the details is the thing, isn't it? No. No, no. I didn't. Have, I, I yeah. never heard that point raised before. Mm. If there was any yeah. issue about that, I do think he right. was. Uh, yeah. No. But my point before I talked to you was that he did have advanced knowledge of the rising. Yes. Uh, yeah. So th I wanted to say that to explain to people um, how his position of leadership. Uh, was yeah. at a very high level, and chief of staff, he must have not had advanced knowledge of the right. Yeah, so um, it comes late. It becomes controversial later in the the court martial. Well, what he yeah. said in his court martial is a different issue. Yes, that's okay. So let's go yeah. to that. That's a different yeah. Thing. yeah. So this is quite interesting because I'm learning stuff today that I wasn't really aware of. I just accepted some of this stuff as fact, and it turns out it's not fact at all. Uh, and this is history. It, it keeps, you know, depending on the people's point of view and the sources that they have access to. Uh, it changes, and your own view of it then has to change with it. Okay? That's different to revisionism. Revisionism is the deliberate distortion of history to suit a political agenda, which we'll come to as well. So you can see there are a fine body of men. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this photograph before. Uh, it's of uh, Irish Citizen Army volunteers um, on the roof of Liberty Hall. Uh, again, it's from the 1930 book. I took that with my, my phone camera, so apologies for the quality, but it's not a great quality picture anyway. It's on very flimsy paper. Uh, but you can see that they're very well turned out. Their uniforms are pristine, they've got all their kit, uh, they're armed, uh, and they're very much in control of whatever situation they're in. These are disciplined men, and the discipline that they would have got would have come from Michael's experience in the British Army. He brought that level of discipline. One thing he also wanted to bring, and it also becomes important later on in the story, he wanted to bring uh, the use of, of guerrilla tactics into play. And he learned those guerrilla tactics, obviously, uh, in, while he was in India. And they were very, very effective for, for uh, basically a ragtag army of tribesmen to keep the whole British army tied down for three years on the northwest frontier without really achieving any strategic objective. Um, the tactics must have been excellent. And really, the way they looked at it there was, uh, you know, canyons, um, gorges, all the things that you find in mountains are actually found in the city like Dublin as well. Side streets, main streets, streets, places for ambush, choke points that were used later in the 2021 20, campaign, uh, like up at uh, Anger Street, the top of Anger Street, where the Road Narrows was called the Dardanelles during the 19, uh, during 1921, because the uh, the uh, auxiliaries um, were constantly being hit there. So th those kind of things, he had those ideas already when he came back, and uh, they came up against the kind of fixed uh, notion of self-sacrifice that Pierce and the volunteer movement had, which was said, let's seize buildings and make a big statement. Um, and that was obviously a military mistake. But Michael was under di military discipline himself, so he would have gone along with the strategic plan. Let, let's have a rising. That was, seemed to be the, uh, the, kind of the governing objective. Let, let's have a rising uh, and see how it goes. Rather than <coughs> the, the Michael uh, point of view and the Connolly point of view, and, and even Collins had the same point of view running up to the rising. That, you know, why can't we have a, uh, a long, drawn-out guerrilla campaign? There was quite, quite some, some quite good political reasons why the way they did it was the right thing. Uh, politically, with the Irish people at the time, um, pretty much pro-British, uh, especially with the First World War going on, um, a campaign of the, the biting of the flea, that would, would that just have annoyed the Irish people and turned them further against the nationalists? Uh, or does a big statement of self-sacrifice bring the people on side? Well, you know, it did. Um, so it's very hard to, to gainsay what happened. But militarily, uh, you know, a guerrilla campaign, uh, as has been proved over and over, generally achieves its objectives rather than a small group of people attacking a massive army. So the rising itself, so he, this stage he'd been promoted, uh, quite close to the rising, promoted to the rank of commandant within the Irish Citizen Army uh, and, and the role of Chief of Staff of the uh, Irish Citizen's Army. Um, he was given command on the day of the St. Stephen's Green Garrison. They invested the Green. Um, he didn't have enough men, and this was the whole problem with the Rising. To achieve the plans that they wanted, they would have to occupy all four sides of the Green. 
Everybody in here knows St. Stephen's Green. Uh, so he kept a part of the plan, which was to dig trenches within the green and, and hold the space rather than hold the high ground. So this was a military mistake. Now whether it was a military mistake in the planning or a military mistake on Michael's behalf, again, it's open to question. But we can probably assume that he followed orders because he was an ex-soldier, knew what he was doing, and he followed the orders, assuming he would be reinforced later on. That's my view. Others may disagree. So, once they invested the green, um, they then became subject to British Army uh, machine gun fire from the top of Shel the Shelburne Hotel. Uh, uh, when you read the books, um, especially the 1930 book, which I put a lot of faith in, uh, the first uh, casualty um, took a stream of machine gun bullets uh, from his left shoulder across his body down to his right hip. Uh, Michael, according to the book, helped him to safety. He was lowered down the back of a building onto a stretcher brought to hospital and incredibly survived. Uh, I don't know the soldier's name. Um, so uh, th that was the kind of fighting that was. They were under fire the whole time. Eventually, he pulled all his outposts in uh, and went into the College of Surgeons, which as you know is a, a fairly, fairly stern block that's not going to be easy to break into. He did make attempts to attack the British positions, uh, but he didn't have enough men and his firepower just wasn't there. He didn't have the mills bombs that he would have needed. He didn't have machine guns. He didn't have the right gear to storm, for example, the Shelburne Hotel to get out the machine gun post on the top. So by the end of the week, they had retreated back into the building. Another thing about him at this time is that he refused to let uh, the, the soldiers, uh, his own soldiers, destroy the art and the furnishings in the College of Surgeons. The College of Surgeons would have been seen as a bastion of the establishment. There were pictures of, of Queen Victoria there. There were, there were pictures of kings and queens from long ago. One of the soldiers attacked one of the pictures. He reprimanded them and wouldn't let them attack any more of the pictures in there. He said, we're not here to, to destroy art, we're basically here to fight the British. Uh, those things belong to other people, you're not to destroy anything in here. Um, also, on one of the forays uh, for one of his patrols, they went to uh, tunnel through buildings to try and get at the British. Uh, they came across a, shop, a couple of shop girls who had been told, of course, that there was Germans fighting in the city. They saw rosary beads wrapped around the hand of one of Michael's soldiers. Uh, and heard them talking, one of the shop girls apparently said to the other, uh, look at them, they're Catholics, and I think they're Irish. And it just shows the misinformation, the confusion that was going on in the city at the, at the time. A lot of people thought there was Germans fighting in the city, which is incredible. Uh, and I don't think that that's a story that's well known. So uh, he then surrendered. Um, and, oh sorry, before you ask, I have the points in order. There are several other controversies relating to uh, what went on in St. Stephen's Green at, at the time. Uh, Countess Markovich was second in command of St. Stephen's Green. Actually, the tunic she wore uh, all the way through the fighting was one that she borrowed from, from Michael himself. Uh, she actually converted to Catholicism at the end of the, the campaign uh, due to the example shown by uh, Mr. Partridge, who was a friend. He was a, a, a council member in Dublin City and a friend of, of Michael. And he was uh, in the College of Surgeons during Easter week with him and Michael's example, of course, so she converted afterwards. So she would have been quite close to, to Michael and to Mr. Partridge. Um, but there is controversy about her own behaviour uh, during Easter week, and it's been seized on by a few people. And it was it concerns the shooting of an unarmed uh, Dublin Metropolitan Police officer, um, who, now, depends, depends which version you believe of this story. Uh, apparently, in the usual DMP manner, these are the same people that attacked the striking workers, remember, in O'Connell Street. Uh, they were all big strapping men, six foot two, six foot three tall, very well built. They were, they were employed in the DMP for that reason, uh, for breaking heads when need be. They were, you know, seven, like the RUC, or RAC, sorry, uh, Freudian strip. Uh, like the RAC, they were, uh, they were a semi-military force, okay? Um, and, and there's another thing, actually, that not a lot of people know. The, the black and tans were part of the RAC. Um, they, were, they didn't have the right uniforms, and they were mixed black and tan, and that's why they were called the black and tans. But they never served in Dublin. So if you hear people talking in Dublin about black and tans, they're wrong. There was no black and tans in Dublin. There was auxiliaries who were a lot worse, believe me. These were people, a lot of them with shell shock uh, from the officer class, who were unemployed in Britain after the war. It wasn't a country fit for heroes. Um, and they were, uh, they were given jobs. At a pound a day, was it a pound a day, I think? Yeah, which was huge money, given that Michael had won the prize for one pound six shillings and, or seven shillings and sixpence for being the best shot in the company. These guys were on a pound a day as mercenaries, and they were let loose in, um, in, in, in the city on the people. Sorry, I digress. Uh, so the DMP, 
uh, this man came along and uh, ordered them to, the, the volunteers to remove their barricades in Stephen Street. You lot, this is the story that I've heard through my family. So uh, it was, you lot, remove those barricades, you, you scruffy beggars, or words to those effect. And apparently the Countess decided that these people need to know we're serious and show them dead, just like that. So that's the story that, that's been handed down to me. I don't know if anybody here has heard. I know one of that story, but yeah. I don't know whether it's true yeah. or false. But so, I mean, yeah. I think uh, Paul O'Brien has written the book. He's given a blow by blow account of exactly. Yeah. He almost traces every bullet that was fired that day, you know. Yeah. So he'll tell you who was shot and who wasn't. Yeah, shot. it was an inter interesting story. Patrick Zane said that this was impossible because uh, at the time when that happened, uh, uh, Mark Rich was doing a tour of the sites of the Citizen Army. Mm. and was at uh, City Hall at that time. Uh, that was her testimony. Yeah. So it's I, interesting. I don't know if it's fair. Yeah, yeah. That was her after 1913 that yeah. they what they got. But, uh, and, and, and that's an story. opinion a lot of people, actually. So, uh, so whether it's true or false or not, really it doesn't make that much difference. In the context of revisionism, though, it's been seized on by people like Kevin Myers to say this was ultimately a bloodthirsty mob who were just going to kick it up because they didn't earn enough money and were just going to have to murder people. The murder gang, uh, as, as the, was the phrase at the time, okay? So they seize on this historically as, and here's a really good example. I'll talk about other examples in a minute. So that's, I like this photograph. Um, it shows Michael, maybe bloody but unbowed, and the Countess beside him, who appears to <coughs> have a slight smile on her face. Um, so they obviously uh, weren't ashamed of what they'd done, wearing their uniforms, standing up straight, uh, and seemed quite relaxed uh, about the future. So, um, also, if we look behind, you can see that contrary to popular opinion, probably a lot of the volunteers that took part that day weren't actually in uniform. And if you see them being the pictures of being marched off from Frank Gok, um, very few of them were in uniform. So, um, it, it, it would have been confusing for the people in Dublin. Who are, who are these guys that are fighting? They're in plain clothes a lot of them. Who are they? So. Sir, where is the contest there? This way, to his left. To Michael's left. She was that's, that's the commanding officer and second in command. I think this is fantastic. You know, we're still having conversations now about should women be allowed on the front lines? This is 1916. You know, we 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 guaranteed women equality in our proclamation of independence, and just to prove that, we put them in the front lines and armed them. I put them in uniform. I wouldn't recognise her as a woman. <laughs> Part of yeah, she's she's wearing Michael's tunic. Yeah, but there's on her hat. I think in a better copy of the photograph, I think there's some flowers yeah. here on the hat. Yeah. A feather. It's a feather, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Feather. yeah. But the volunteers didn't allow women into the, to, wear, to wear arms. Because yeah. the citizen army didn't have that. Yeah, and you can see the influence of, of, uh, of Connolly on the proclamation, uh, uh, you know, giving equal rights to all, including even women. My goodness, imagine. Yeah. So there you go. Um, so they've surrendered now, they've taken down to Richmond Barracks. And one thing that's interesting later that, um, in, in his last letters is that he wouldn't allow any, um, any bad comments or any blame be attached to the soldiers he fought against and who captured him and put him in prison, nor to the police that were involved at the time. He just, now, if you look at movies like Michael Collins and you see how, uh, which is quite a true representation of how the people were treated up at the top of O'Connell Street where they were kept near the Garden of Remembrance there um, overnight, the first time they were captured, they were beaten, they were urinated on. Um, they were treated very badly. In comparison, Michael and his last letter wouldn't let any blame be attached to his opponents because he felt, I think, he'd been treated, treated quite well by the ordinary soldiers in place. Um, you know, and, and I asked myself the question, why would that be? Is it because maybe the soldiers and policemen in question came from working class backgrounds themselves and kind of understood why he was doing what he did and had quite a bit of respect for him? Whereas, <laughs> sorry, of course. Um, uh, which people treated the soldiers so badly? There was it the native Dublin people. No, it was the army. Yeah, the, Br the, the British, British army. army. Yeah. All right, thank you. Now remember, the British army that were holding them, they were probably been fighting against them all week. Yeah. And probably had friends who were killed or right. maimed. Uh, so you, you can kind of understand it in a way. Right. In the heat of the moment, they treated them badly. So this was before yeah. the sixteen rising. No, this was this was after the soldiers were captured. After the uh, after the Republicans surrendered. They were taken up to where the Garden of Remembrance is now, and they were kept in the open all night before the British decided where to move them. And at what yeah. point were they shipped off to, to England? Uh, that was after kind of the, the show trials had yeah. happened. After the show trials had happened, the court martials, um, at the same time the guys were being executed, the rest of the lads were sent off to England. Right. 
Because my father was in 16 and he was jailed in... Um, oh God. They were sent to Wales, to Frank Gock. No, yeah. well, not all of them. Don't right, so I don't Lewis think my dad was in Frank Gock. He wasn't in Frank Gock. Lewis Prison, probably. He was in um, Nutsford. Nutsford, yeah. yeah. I, I, absolutely. Uh, they yeah. went to a few different places. I know Mr. Partridge, who fought in Easter Week with, with Michael, was sent to Lewis Prison. Michael Collins was there as well. Right. But uh, he suffered very badly in prison. He died shortly after. What year would that have been? That would have been. They came home in uh, 1970. So they were, they were less than a year, I think, in front yeah. of us. Yeah. Um, and they were sent home. And, and I actually have a, a first copy, first edition of With the Irish in Frank Gough by Etchingham, yeah. who was a Wexford volunteer uh, yeah. from Enniscorthy. Actually, one of the only places that had a really successful rising besides Dublin was Enniscorthy, which not a lot of people know about. Yeah. There was also a rising in, in Galway, which not a lot of people know about, which Mellows was involved in. So, um, so and, and, and their story in Frank Gough, that was, that was the Republican University. That was where they really got serious and planned the campaign from, from 1980 and onwards. Um, that it would be a guerrilla campaign. And that's where they learned from each other what went right and what went wrong and what should we do next. Yeah. So, so court martials happened. Um, and again, you know, we have the controversy about what was and wasn't said uh, at the. And, and this is so mixed up now that you almost can't believe anything about what happened. One of the funny things, which is, it's not really a subject for levity, but the, uh, the prosecuting officer was a Captain Blackadder, believe it or not. So, uh, I'm gone. Captain Blackadder. So, uh, Captain Blackadder in popular culture is a character uh, in a comedy series on TV. Yeah. So, uh, I, I always get a giggle when I read the name. I was actually going to put a picture up of, of Captain Blackadder. But <laughs> cunning so, plan. Yeah. I decided it was too cunning a plan. Not in the case of Malin. Was, well, no, Malin's prosecuting McConchie. was... McConchie. He was president. Yes. Of, yeah. yes. But Which there was another man as well. Seth was the other man as well. There were three presidents, three yeah. trial, uh, two, three teams, yeah. two teams, but three presidents right. of the courts. Yeah. Very good. So, so what's the controversy here? The controversy says that Michael uh, tried to save himself by blaming the countess and saying she was in charge. Or just did but the controversy is yeah. very. Uh, yeah. 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 No, the yeah. controversy is that the trials, the the, the, the act under which they were tried, mm. wasn't applied. They didn't right. apply the act in the, the strict the sense. Yeah. Yeah. They, they tried them under the terms and conditions as set out by Maxwell. Maxwell yeah. made his yeah. own rules. Yeah, so he was the, the military. He, denied, he made it in camera, he denied yeah. them uh, legal representation, and he denied them jury trials. And he tried them on a Monday, and he executed them on a Tuesday. Yeah. Oh my if that's no, justice, there's no right of appeal. Yeah. yeah, so there's no justice there. Yeah. But plus, he used military courts to try them in, field, uh, General Court Marshal, yeah. which allowed him to do literally what he wants. Yeah. So these are the issues that the big issues, yeah. and of course, nobody was there to witness what was said and what wasn't said. And of course, everybody below McConchie was the subordinate of the. They were told. Plus, McConchie was subordinate to Mick Maxwell. To Maxwell. And he knew Max Maxwell yeah. what Maxwell wanted, so McConchie wrote what Maxwell wanted to read. Right. So, so that's the that's yeah. the issue. Yeah. So what was said at the at the trials and, and the transcripts of those mm. trials. Well, there are transcripts, but what we're saying is they were written in a way to reflect yes. positively yeah. upon the prosecutors yes. and not and negatively upon the, yeah. the yeah. rascally rebels. Yeah, yeah. the terms and conditions of setting up those trials has to be questioned. Yeah. And, and that's the issue. Yeah. And the, under the Act, under the Defence of the Realm Act, you, you couldn't have had any uh, involvement, you couldn't be, have a personal interest in this person you were trying, mm -hmm. but in fact, McConchie had been, had been uh, Malin's officer, a commanding officer in the Tira campaign. There's so, something I didn't know. That's yeah. Another fact. Yeah. Yeah. He spent his military career in India in that same period, yeah. and then he was his judge and jury, judge and jury yeah. at the trial. So yeah. he had a vested interest yeah. to say, one of my soldiers would not walk free from treason. Yes, the same reason that they shot Sean McBride, because yes. he had fought against them before, or he yes. had an association with them yeah. before. He's going down. And he's Conley. Going down. Well, yeah. Conley was the last man to be executed. They yeah. weren't going to lose out on him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Even though he was badly injured and shot, shot in a seat. Even though they had yeah. ceased the yeah. executions. Conley's yeah. execution is on the 12th. That's right. They had ceased the days later. Because yeah. Asquith yeah. was saying, would you stop that carry on? But, you know, he was getting fierce. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Asquith was right. Yes. Um, yeah. Given subsequent events. So th there's the controversy. There was a lot of statements made about, about Michael, um, you know, uh, basically saying, uh, I, I want to get out of this. Now, it, it's, there, there's obviously huge confusion 
about what actually happened. Nobody really knows. But what it did say to me, and the point I wanted to get across through, through this about the, uh, the controversies around the, the court martial, right, was that to me, even if he had done that, even if he had tried to get out of it, you have got to realise this was a man with four young children and a baby on the way. Um, they had no money, he was working class, he was basically just about keeping a roof over his head at the time. He was living in the Union Hall with his family. Um, what would you say? This is what I asked myself, what would I say? Would I try and get out of it if I could? Of course I would. Why, why wouldn't you try and get out of it if you could? Knowing your wife is out there, and knowing my wife, she'd kill me herself if I didn't try and get out of it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I think the story even makes him a lot more human than he is. But, excuse me, would, yes. you, would you believe that he would actually blame a woman and that a woman take his place? This, exactly. If you, that we talked about this earlier, and it is very hard to believe. I given given the man, that. given his interest in Joseph Conrad and Lord Jim, yeah. um, where it's about redemption based on a previous failure, yeah. it's hard, it's very, actually, it's very hard to believe he would have tried to blame yeah. him. Yeah. So then if you wanted to destroy a military man's career, you would say exactly that? Yes. He right, tried to blame a woman. He tried yeah. to blame a woman. She yeah. was close to him, you, and he'd say yeah. that. Yeah. And you would write that yeah. because you would. McClashey didn't know that they'd locked the documents away for, for 19 odd years in 1999. He didn't know that. But he wanted to destroy Mike's career, yeah. right, or the memory of him. Yeah. So he had a vested interest in doing that. Um, and when you tell a lie one day and it's locked up for 99 years, it's still a lie. And, yes. and then if you know Mike and if you know the character of man and that he is, yes, and if you know yeah. the character of, his character is backed up by most of his comrades yes. and most of the people in the system and they talk about him and they talk only in good terms and they say this is not the character of a man. And his example led the yes. Countess to convert to Catholicism yes. the, the week after Easter week. Yeah. So it is very hard to swallow. And what we have decided we're going to do is the family are going to get together to put together all the pieces that we all know from different sides of the country, which is now spread out everywhere, to try and get a clearer picture. Of, Remember, of, the generation the that would have refuted this is gone. Yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> your dad. Well, Father Joe is still there. Father Joe is still there. never been seen uh, yeah. only on, uh, before 1999. Yeah. And so the historians are getting them now and they're reading and interpreting them and yeah. start to take it at face value, take it as good fact. Mm. And what we're saying is, they're not fact, they're uh, propaganda. Yeah. yeah. The Mar in the case of Markievicz, um, her trial, uh, her prosecutor was uh, Blackadder, but um, the lead, the prosecuting guy in the, in the, on the floor was uh, a man called Wiley. Wiley wrote a memoir. And Wiley's memoir, he said, she, she winged and she moaned about, you can't shoot me because I'm a woman. Yeah. But there were contemporaries around at the time who were able to say, rubbish. Absolute rubbish, yes, yeah. I read that. Her trial transcript, yeah. Her trial transcript doesn't even yeah. mention anything about it. One of the things I heard she said was, do your worst. Yes. You know, yeah. um, which, which would fit is, in her personality. Yeah, the point yeah. is, when you hide something for so long, it's very hard because that generation is gone. Mm. So, with all due yeah. respect to the family, they weren't there in the, in the court martial room. Of course, they weren't. There, there was one person in the court martial, and, and in one case, I think they were allowed to call a witness who was a volunteer as well. But most of the time there was one, uh, two were tried together, I think. Most of the time there was one person in there and the rest were the, the British Army. Yeah. So the only uh, word that you have for that is if they said something before they were executed or uh, the records of the British Army took. Yeah. Now, of course, you can, you can uh, challenge the British Army uh, records, but, and this is a very interesting point, uh, Blackadder, as, uh, as you said, an alliant uh, Markovic, but the yeah. records contradicted it. Yeah. Now, if they were just out on a, you know, a black propaganda team, they would have uh, falsified her records as well, but they didn't. Mm. So my view is that on the, on the balance of evidence, the, 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 the mm. uh, court martial records are correct. And you have to remember that quite often, military people do things according to the rules, even though you might think it doesn't really work out for them in the end. Like, uh, the Nazis kept whole loads of records that they were on the news against them. Uh, so I think on the balance and, of and, and there's, there's another story that I've heard. Can I address that, yeah. please? What do you mean? Sorry, my name is Jeremy. Good. Yeah. If you look at the case of the trial of Shouldice and O'Donovan, you'll see that the trial record is totally inaccurate in that case. 
And, and a very excellent book written by Sean Enright has pointed at all the inaccuracies, and he's pointed to the inaccuracies in the trial records, which only brings into uh, question is do we accept these as fact or do we accept these as inaccurate? I, I accept them not necessarily as fact, but I accept them as a record of what they, uh, as a likely record, we can't be certain of what went on inside. Uh, and there were, there were inaccuracies. So what's a likely were, record? Sorry? What's a likely record? That, that could be anything you want it to be. If we're going to be saying that, sorry, so the, the records are a source of information about the trials, okay? Um, there so are those, yeah. be, because we don't accept them, yeah. our, my opinion is just a good experiment's opinion. Yeah, that's why this is a controversy. It is a controversy, even within the family it's a controversy. Um, but me, my own opinion, and I'm talking about it right, from my perspective, is I don't care one way or the other. Because, to me, if he didn't do it, he's a man I know him to be anyway. And even if he did, it just displays his humanity. And uh, so, I I've tried to move past it. Uh, we need to get more information. But I, I, I have a lot of sympathy. Uh, no, for I, I just want to give you another example. Yeah. Can you imagine a man like Michael Mallon, who probably left school at 14 years of age if he was lucky? In fact, he was in the army at about that age. So probably left the school at about 10 or 12 years of age. Can you imagine him using words like, I indignantly repudiate any, any allegation of me assisting the enemy? Could you imagine him speaking like that? I can hardly get the words out. I've, I've heard Dublin people use words of wouldn't believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think you want to do that. When I yeah. read words like that, when I read Mike's letters, letters yeah. we all begin in errors. When yeah. I read words like that, and when I read Mike's letters, I realise that that's a making up story written by the officer in command to so say what he wanted the outcome to be. So, so folks, folks, yes, yeah. yeah. So, folks, and, and Michael couldn't actually spell it. You've seen I have sake of a, and I yes, found a, lot, yeah. a lot of spelling inaccuracies and, and punctuation was non-existent for him. But one thing it does say is even at, at the remove of 99 years from when this happened, there's still a person living that visited his father in the cell before he was shot. And you can still see the pain and the bitterness in the family. Um, and it comes down, because sometimes when I do talks like this, I get a lump in my throat talking about it. And I think about my small children, and if I was leaving them. And I think you should put yourself in his position. What must he have felt like? So you can see the way the controversies are very hurtful. Um, they're shocking, you know. Uh, I got a lump in my throat when I heard that he had a twin. There's so much there that, you know, we don't know. Um, and I, I think it's nice that there's people that still remember him. And I think it's nice that there's people here that want to hear about it, uh, whatever about the controversies. Okay. So, sorry, sorry. yeah, sorry. What happened to Countess Moscovic at the end? What did they, how did they, the authorities oh. treat her? Um, I she was her sentence. Yeah, she, was commuted, she, got, she, got, she got sentenced to death, but her, her sentence was, was commuted to oh. imprisonment. And she didn't serve very long in prison. Like the rest, she didn't serve very long. I don't know where she served uh, time, but uh, she didn't spend very long in prison because she was very active very soon afterwards again. Right. So, once the sentence of death had been uh, pronounced on Michael, he was removed to Kilmain in jail, which was where they were going to shoot him. Um, some would say murder him, and um, it depends on your point of view. Judicially, murder him, which has happened in many countries since, not only Central America, to name but one area. Um, but as he was heading from Richmond up to, um, and this again pulls at the heartstrings, he passed his own house. Where, where his family lived. Yeah. And he didn't see anybody. He looked out of the truck and couldn't see anybody, but he saw his little dog crying sitting at the door of the house. And you can just imagine how, how, how hard that must have been for him to pass his own house uh, that he would never see again, never see the inside again. He'd never pet his dog again. He might see fun, but the dog, that was the last time he would ever see his dog. All of these thoughts must have been going through his head. Yeah. And, and again, it's very, very hard to think about things like that. And I think, but I think people should think about them to realize the sacrifice that he made. Um, and he knew what was coming. And he would have heard shots in the days leading up, but knowing his comrades were being shot as well. So he had to go through all of that knowing he was next. It was cruel. It was inhuman. It was all, even by the standards of those times, the way the men were treated was inhuman. Um, there's lots of sources uh, and lots of different witnesses that talk about the last visit of his family uh, on the night before he was to be shot. Uh, Father Joe was there, but doesn't really uh, have any clear memory of it. Um, but his, his older brothers, uh, certainly especially um, Seamus, 
Um, he, was he was only 12. He, he was 12, yeah. but had very, very clear memories of visiting his father in prison. Of what year did Seamus die? Mm -hmm. What year did he pass away? Yeah, yeah, what year did Seamus? 82. 82. 82 yeah. So he was still there as a primary source in 1982. Yeah, he was 12 and his father. He, he, he was very close yeah. to his father, actually. Yeah. Which, is, which, again, is almost impossibly uh, difficult to think about when you think about your own children. Imagine saying goodbye to your 12-year-old son and your 2-year-old son. And that all comes out in his last letter as well. Um, but the, the priests came in, um, they were visiting next door, and one of the priests, uh, one of the Capuchin priests, uh, has stated that he heard the sobbing and the cries of anguish coming from the cell next door, and he went in to, uh, to comfort them, which is very hard to even talk about. Um, he was then, obviously, he was shot on the 8th of May. Am I right so, in thinking that one of his sons became a Jesuit? That's right, I'm going to talk about that now. Oh, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he, he was um, interred in uh, Arbor Hill, um, and he's, which is where he is still interred. They were buried in quicklime and, um, and put into a, a, basically what was a military prison and, and buried in, in the yard there, which is now a national monument. So, so what happened afterwards? He was... And again, this is to reflect on why, because he knew all this was coming. He had a fair idea of what would be coming for his family uh, after he died, being a working class man. And also remember, he was, he was a member of, uh, he wasn't a member of the, the more middle class volunteer movement, which, which fan classes, to be fair, but led by the middle classes. He was a member of the working class movement, the citizens army. So, but to be fair to him, he wrote, when he wrote to his wife Agnes, as uh, you can see, Agnes was a beautiful woman. This was taken probably, I would say, quite early in the marriage or just before uh, she was married. She's quite young in the picture. Um, in his last letter to her, he, she asked him to, he asked her to approach a particular person um, and said, he'll know what to do. It is due to you as the wife of one of the fallen. So while he may have been very worried about what would happen to his family afterwards, he was also trying to convince himself and and obviously his wife trying to comfort her by saying, it's okay, approach this man, you'll be looked after. He'll know what to do. So were they looked after afterwards by a grateful Irish state in 1922 and 23 and 24? And I'm afraid the answer is an abject no, they weren't looked after. Um, they looked after themselves and were looked after by family. Yeah, and and she, yeah. they, they got very little, she got very yes. little after that because uh, mm. Michael wasn't a signatory of the proclamation. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. You can give your life for Ireland, but unless you actually sign the document, we're not going to give you anything. And that's what it came down to, and I have some evidence of that from the military archives recently. One of her letters were written basically on her deathbed while she was lying down. And you can see it's a short letter, and the handwriting isn't as good as the letters that she wrote previously looking for her pension. Is that his wife? His wife, Agnes. Yeah. So, so again, Agnes is, is buried in the, the churchyard beside my house. I can visit her grave every day, and uh, her daughter Maura is buried there also. Um, and she came from the area that I'm from. She would have come from the chapel of Strawberry Beds area where the Hickeys lived, and are still remembered in the area, which is nice. Uh, and all of the family, the Teolises, the Hickeys, uh, and Malins, uh, are buried in, in the churchyard all together under, under a beautiful tree that has beautiful white blossoms um, around Easter time, which is very nice. So. So this is the family. Um, it would have been in late summer uh, after Moore was born. Uh, so from the left is, uh, is Seamus, and he was 12 going on 13, probably there. Um, Joseph, Father Joe, who's still with us, thanks be to God, uh, is next. And you can see he's, he's been obviously taken care of by his brother, which is really nice to see. Um, Sean, um, who I'll talk a little bit about in a moment as well. Uh, Moore is the baby. And uh, that must have been extremely hard. Um, she, she was heavily pregnant at the time Michael was executed. Agnes herself and, and Una, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Una as well, uh, because this comes around the subject of revisionism and I'll tell you about that. Una was never a family uh, that I knew best and knew most because every time she came home to Ireland she visited my mother. My mother carried out a correspondence with her for maybe 40 years. Um, and my mother still has a lot of those letters from Una as well. Una was a very passionate follower of Irish affairs, was very Republican in, in her outlook from what I knew of her, my experience of her. Uh, I actually picked her up from the airport 
uh, once he was in drop at the airport, which was going back to Spain. We'll talk a little bit about her in a minute. So that's the family that he left behind him. Yeah, a beautiful, a lovely little family, as we say in Ireland, right? Um, a beautiful family. And again, the anguish of leaving them behind must have been impossible. These are fair copies, you see the stamps on them, and I have the copies that we got from uh, the, the military archives uh, on the table over here. My father-in-law, who's a historian, got them for me. These are, um, so was where the family looked after. This is a receipt for payment of fees uh, into St. Enda's for Father Joe, um, from whatever year it is, I can't make it out there. Uh, and this is a receipt for payment of fees um, for, for Una, for uh, the Red Convent. Um, my understanding is that Mrs. Pierce covered Joe's fees. Would that be right, Una? Were Joe's fees covered by Mrs. Pierce? Sorry? Were Joe's fees oh, for, for St. Andrews covered by Mrs. Pierce? Yeah. Yeah. So, and this was a receipt for those fees that Mrs. Pierce from the college would have given to Agnes to say, the fees are covered, here's your receipt. So that's from the military records. Uh, this one here, I don't know who covered the fees for Una in, in Loretto Convent, but a benefactor did. I don't know who it was. If there's anybody here that does know who it was, I'd be very interested to know. Which convent was it? Loretto Convent. Loretto. Yeah. So it was the Loretto Convent in Bray. St. Enda's in Rathfarnham. This was Patrick Pierce's school that he formed, oh, right. the Irish College. Right. Yeah. So we don't know, just received with thanks for the fees for Una, um, and we don't know who, who the benefactor was. No, I don't. But it wasn't the Irish state, I can tell you that. Right. Okay. These are two letters uh, from Agnes again to the state, requesting her pension uh, and requesting financial help. She actually worked uh, very hard. She, uh, she worked at cleaning. She worked at various other different things. Um, I don't know too much details. She was a trained she, nurse. She was a trained nurse. Did she work as a nurse? Yes. She was a nurse. Yeah. So she developed tuberculosis and took to her bed. My own mother had tuberculosis and she so developed forth. tuberculosis from a fall. From a fall, yeah. From the hip. Yeah. My own mother uh, suffered from tuberculosis and was in hospital for the best part of uh, 18 months when she was 16 years old and uh, had an almost miraculous recovery from it. Um, that's a different story. Uh, this is a later letter looking for support from the state. Remember, this is the widow of a 1916 leader whose centenary we were just about to celebrate. Um, she's taken to her bed. If I think about my mother, how ill she was. Agnes was in bed at home. You can see by the address. It's Loyola, the South Circle Road. Um, her handwriting has disimproved. It's a shorter letter. She wrote it lying in bed, so you can imagine she was probably writing it like this. The help wasn't forthcoming. These are basically the letters of a widow to the Irish state begging for some sort of support. Um, she then eventually died in 1932, um, I think it was. Uh, this uh, is an excerpt, I think, from uh, the Irish press or its predecessor. I'm not sure what year the Irish press was founded in. Um, but this is, uh, it was a very long article. I just cut a couple of snips off it. That was the start of the article. And this was, um, this again was given to me by my father-in-law, who's a historian. And this was a list of some of this goes on of the chief mourners in the cortege and it's a who's who of, uh, it's out of focus, I'm sorry, but it's a who's who of Irish history at the time, of all the major figures in Irish history. So they all turned up at the funeral, but where the hell were they when she needed them? When she was writing begging letters. Yeah. And that gets to me as well. This is Agnes's headstone, beside my house, by coincidence, um, and also the, uh, the grave of, of Maura and Maura's husband who died back in uh, I think it was 1966, um, she had nursed him, Maura had nursed him, Maura had a, a, a tough enough life, uh, she was married to, to Robert, but I believe he'd been in a motor bike accident, is that right? Yeah, and, uh, and she, she nursed him herself, and spent a lot of her life nursing him, uh, and then passed away herself in 2005, which was the first time I met Father Joe, when he came home for the funeral, which was again right beside the house, uh, and I met him again in 2009, and I've been in correspondence with him. And my wife's father is in constant correspondence with him because he's trying to get all the details he can get uh, as a historian. This is um, a picture of Father Joe, and those that know my family know that he's the absolute spitting image there of my younger brother. Uh, if I looked at that, I would say that's a picture of my brother, um, which is absolutely stunning. Um, that's, that's Tom, 
uh, my great grandfather uh, in the middle, who played for Shamrock Rovers, was also a renowned cyclist and ran marathons, which is unusual. So he also smoked a pipe, I think, so it's hard to put the two of those things together. Um, he had a, a, a penchant for wearing tweed suits and plus fours, and you can see that in the photograph of a nice tweed suit. And that's Father Sean uh, on the right. This photograph was taken in 1946, uh, and the, the original is over there, which Father Joe gave me in 2009, uh, because my great-grandfather was in it. Um, he said, just have this. And I'd never seen a picture of my great-grandfather before, so this was fabulous. Uh, it was taken on the occasion of Father Joe's ordination, and the picture was taken up in uh, Milltown, in the Jesuit house in Milltown. Uh, and obviously Father Sean was there as well uh, the day, and that's a lovely photograph to have. So, what happened to them all afterwards? So Sean became a Jesuit priest, spent his life in Galway as a teacher, from what I understand, a uh, very good one, and is buried in Galway. Uh, Luna became a Loretta nun, also known as, she was a devil Luna, she was great crack, um, a, a, a very small little noise, thin, thin for like a little bird, um, but constantly on the move and on the go, and constantly talking and very curious. She was also known as Mother Dolores and also known as, as Sister Agnes. They were her, um, her nom de guerre, if you like, in the Loretta order. She joined the Loretta nuns, um, didn't particularly like it, uh, and was going to leave, till they said, well, give her one last try, go out to Seville, to our, to our house out there, and see if you like it. She went there, and she absolutely adored it. Um, she loved it. My parents visited her there uh, back in the 1970s. Um, she used to come home regularly enough, and after she died, um, uh, a good friend of mine was posted at Seville from her job, and he went and visited her grave and, uh, and, and put some lilies on the grave for us, which was nice. Uh, but I'll come back to Una, because there's, there's interest in Una as well. Uh, Joe, as we know, is, is a Jesuit priest. Um, this is from talking to him. Uh, I understand he's been expelled three times uh, from, from China in personal conversations with him. Uh, I know about two of them. The third one I'm not too sure of. But the first time he actually uh, ended up uh, on Taiwan, um, not with the Chinese at Formosa, with Chiang Kai-shek, or with, uh, yeah, in the court of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was, at the time of the, the rebellion uh, by Mao Zedong, uh, the Communist Revolution, Chiang Kai-shek was more or less an emperor, a military emperor of China. Um, so Father Zhou, who's still with us, ended up at his court in, in Taiwan. Uh, when he was expelled with all the other Jesuits. They eventually came back in, some of them in secret, uh, some of them were murdered, some of them were put in prison for life and driven insane. Father Joe got by and is still with us, uh, and his story would make an incredible book, I'm sure. He told me the last time he was home, in 2009, that when the British left Hong Kong and the Chinese took over, he was a little bit worried, obviously, um, and he got a call from the governor's office, the new Chinese governor's office. Uh, Una, I don't know, you might know this story. Um, and he was really worried, and really what it came down to was the Chinese governor actually just wanted to know would Father Joe let his sons into the school that he was the administrator of at the time, which, which, which I'm sure was a massive relief, and I'm sure he said absolutely. <laughs> so so he's, he's still there, uh, still going strong. I believe he's a little bit less mobile now than he used to be. Um, so I don't know if he'll be home next year. He'll be home for two. I doubt it. No, yeah, I doubt it. He's fine up here, but yeah. his mobility is His mobility is very bad. Yeah. I don't think he He'd be 102 next year. Yeah. I had two letters yeah. from him last week. Mm. Did you? He, he's the most, I, I'm not a good correspondent. He gives out to me, you know. Uh, I haven't written to him in quite a while. But he still writes to me and he writes to Arian's father. And he still writes Oscar Oscar Elgin, yes. I have, and, he, and he also writes in old Irish script, which I have to write over Irish sometimes. Because she understands it, I don't. Yeah. So, um, Maura, as I said, was, was, was married to, uh, to Robert. Uh, I think they lived in Terran Europe. Uh, and some of the family are still up there, but, yeah, and uh, she died in 2005. Um, now, Seamus is, is, is a very interesting man. Uh, there's there's a, a mistake here. He wasn't elected to Sinn Féin TD. I got that from somebody else, but it's not true. Uh, Una is his daughter, so she knows better than anybody else. Um, he was an engineer. He, was, uh, he fought on the Republican side in the Civil War. He was captured, uh, uh, at, I understand, at, Guinness, at the Guinness Brewery. Um, it was himself and two friends. This is the story I've heard. They were under arms when they were captured, and the uh, and the uh, the Free Staters were were shooting anybody they found uh, under arms at that stage. They shot 77, so it was a very real threat. Um, I mean, they shot Erskine Childers, who was carrying a pop gun that had been given to him by Michael Collins, a tiny little 2-2 pistol, and they shot him for carrying that. They'd shoot you for any reason, but they could they could drum up 
Um, they were worse than the British. The British, the British, I think, only executed 12 during the War of Independence. During the Civil War, there were 77 Republicans executed. So Seamus, as expected, and his friends were sentenced to death. Uh, my understanding is the sentence was carried out in the other two cases, but Seamus was reprieved and sentenced to prison for his year of two years. And one of the reasons for his reprieve was that it was felt his family had suffered enough at that stage, especially his mother. Mm -hmm. Would that be? He was carrying a rifle. A rifle. He was carrying two. He was carrying two rifles. <laughs> well, he wasn't carrying a concealer, I suppose. Uh, yeah. And I think it's because he was a Malin, they decided not to shoot yeah. another Malin. Yeah. So There's been enough. Yeah. yeah. So his mother was very worried. Yeah. That was during the Civil War. Yes. Yes. Oh, during the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, 1922, I think it was, rather than 23. Yeah. Um, there's not much known what he did during the rest of the Civil War, but he was probably in prison and was released shortly afterwards when the general um, reprieve was given to all the prisoners. Right. Um, he uh, he was an engineer. I don't know much about his life. Luna, it was her dad. She knows everything about his life. But he did become uh, the first chairman of World East Kiwara, serving there for 10 years. I know he was an engineer with the Inland Fisheries Board. Uh, right. Was that right? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and he passed away in 1982, as we said. So, I have a picture of Father Joe from 2009 when he was home, and that's in the Stonebreaker's Yard in Kilmainham, where his father was executed. Oh, um, 1996, 06, wasn't it? Oh, was it 06? And the 90th celebration. 90th, so, yeah. Yeah. right. So, yeah, he's been home three times in the last decade. Yeah. 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 So, when did he die, did you say? No, he's still alive. Oh, he's still alive? Yeah. He's 101 years old. Yeah. So, this is a subject uh, that uh, is controversial. So, revisionism. And I'm going to bring it back to the Mallon family. Um, the first thing we have to keep in mind about the rising was <coughs> it was of his time. It, it was he was a man of his time. What what kind of time was it? Well, there was wars going on uh, throughout Europe. The, the the World War was happening, and and this whole idea, this noble idea of spilling your blood for your country, was accepted by all the major nations taking part in that <coughs> war: the French, the Russians, uh, the British, the Germans, uh, the Italians, uh, the Austro-Hungarians. They all had this same culture, the prevailing culture of self-sacrifice. Now, we also had it here, because we had the cultural revolution, which had been gone on since the early 1900s. Uh, you know, Ku Cullen was, thought it was an example of who an Irishman should be. You know, strong, standing to the last, spill your blood for your country. So, we were no different here, and Michael was of his time, as were the other leaders of the revolution. So, so the people were appealed to by both the Republicans and the British Army at the time. Using the same tools, basically saying, you know, help your fellow Catholics. The British were talking about Belgium and what was happening out there. And the Germans did kill some nuns and priests. The circumstances, though, are a little bit unclear. Uh, but of course, that was used as propaganda to Catholics here to go and fight for Catholics out there. Of course, they didn't say that, you know, probably 60 70% of the German army was Catholic as well. So, uh, you know, appealing to free small nations. Well, we're a small nation. The Republicans would have said, stay here and fight. So all this was going on. Everybody had the same. There was a similar culture going on throughout Europe at the time. And it was to lay down your life uh, for whatever. And this was, this was a culture that was there. Uh, and we can't judge that culture from the of 100 years. We didn't live then. We, don't feel, we can't feel what they felt, you know, or live the lives that they led, and you know, the upbringings that they had. You, you, they thought differently to us. So the whole idea of trying to revise what was going on back there was very unfair. From, from both, and there's, there's two types of revision going on here, and I'll come back to that as well. It was really hard for us to understand. Um, and we didn't live then, and neither did the revisionists. So they understand probably even less, at least we know uh, that we're looking at it from the point of view of distance. They talk as if this is still going on, as this happened yesterday, and these were the same type of people that we are. They were different people. So I, I define revisionism from, from my point of view around history as the reinterpreting of history to suit political purpose. And believe me, this doesn't, does, just doesn't happen on the reactionary right and uh, colonially. It also happens on the left. I'll come back to that in a second as well. So, the revisionist lament for uh, you know, the self-sacrifice and the destruction of life and property that, that was carried out in 1916 to 1921. But they only lament that it happened in Ireland to the Anglo, the Anglo population. They don't lament the destruction that they carry, carried out and carry out on an ongoing basis as an emperor, an expansionist imperialist emperor. They will only lament it when it's done by somebody that stands up against them. They lament what Ireland has become. You have people talking about, oh, look what they did with the country. Look at the crash. 
You know, they couldn't rule anything. So this this kind of rubbish is used all the time. This, this kind of language, a derogatory language about what Ireland has become. What's Ireland? It's a tolerant, multicultural, free society with strong labour laws. Far stronger than they have in Britain, under Thatcher and Spurry laws. Uh, and a current governing party who once called for Nelson Mandela to be hanged as a terrorist. So these are the type of people that are trying to influence a view of Irish history. Yet their own present day laws uh, are some of the most draconian in the world around labour. So, you know, they're just manifestly wrong. They lament the town war. Despite the 1918 vote, and they lied about events to false surrender at Kilmichael, relying on the research of people like Peter Hart. He's a proven liar, a manufacturer of so called interviews, yet his book is accepted by revisionists as the definitive, the definitive book on the IRA and West Cork in, um, in, in, in the revolutionary period. One of the interviews that he claimed to have carried out, the man had been dead for several years before the date he claimed to have carried out the interview. Another one uh, was a stroke victim. And afterwards, his son signed affidavits about the incapacity of his father, saying he couldn't have had that interview with him, which he barely knows his own name. Um, and these are now being used by revisionists as sources, proper primary sources of information. The interviews never happened. They didn't exist. They're lies. And the same source was used for this, these aerated, you know, blown views of a, a, a sectarian, sectarian ethnic cleansing in West Cork. Yeah, a lot of people were shot. And that's what happens in war when you give information to the enemy. You're taken out, you're shot. It happens in every war. So, but they were all Protestants that were shot. Well, people that were in favour of the British occupation at the time tended to be Protestant. That's just a coincidence. It was, it was a, they were killed for political reasons, not for sectarian reasons. But that's now how it's being portrayed in Peter Hart's book and by various people like Owen Hart, uh, Owen Harris in the newspapers. Owen Harris was seven or eight years ago um, wrote an article in the Sunday Independent, I call it the Sunday Rag, um, where he went on a visit to West Cork and his grandfather had been out in the columns. And he said, as I'm leaving West Cork, I'm kind of looking over my shoulder, I'm wondering what my grandfather would think of me. So I actually wrote him a letter and I told him exa exactly what his grandfather would think of him. I didn't get a reply. So, um, at the time they said that people didn't want the rebellion, they didn't want the First World War either. Who wants war? Nobody wants war. But sometimes it just comes because it has to. And things have to be done by those that are willing to do them. And the leaders of the 1916 rebellion knew that. They knew they had to wake the Irish people up. You know, and other people should get over that. Because we've had to get over the consequences of what they did to our country. They need to get over themselves. I wrote this myself in a moment of anger. <laughs> but I liked it. Uh, after reading an article somewhere, I said, these small hypocrites, cosy in their Dublin four, and deepest time of Irish home county, I use that expression purposely, the home county of South West Cork, because it is like one of the home counties in the south of England. Um, the despise and vilify the very people that ensure they have the freedom to express such vilification. And they don't see the contradiction in their own views. So, now, there's a challenge for people, especially people on what we describe as the liberal left in Ireland. Let's put into context, this context into broad relief. Let's say Michael Mallon lived now, okay? The, the Ireland that we're in now. Now, he didn't tell us, you know, this is what you must do, but he did have views on how Ireland should be after he died. And we know that because he wrote it in his letters. So I want to challenge people on the so-called uh, liberal left, as well as the reactionary establishment, to look at Michael's views and challenge themselves. I'm not saying his views were right. I don't have any political views in this context. But people should, uh, when they use Michael's name to support certain causes, which I've heard have been used in over the last few years, they should think about this. At the end, Michael was a nationalist and a Catholic. And which one he put first, he didn't say. Let's look at his writings. First of all, on nationalism, in his last letter to his wife, he said, so must Irishmen pay for trying to make Ireland a free nation. He was talking about his own execution. To his parents, he wrote in his last letter, I tried with others to make Ireland a free nation and failed. Others fell before us and paid the price, and so must we. He accepted his fate. He knew what he was doing, and he accepted it. And this, again, I think challenges back into what we were talking about earlier, about the, the, uh, the controversies. He knew what he was doing, and he accepted his fate. He said to his children in his letter, 
to the two boys, especially Seamus and Sean, remember Ireland. You know, work for Ireland. Live for Ireland. He also said to his wife, I do not believe our blood has been shed in vain. I believe Ireland will come out greater and grander, but she not, must not forget she is Catholic and she must keep her faith. Now put that in the context of the liberal revolution that we've had here recently. If Michael was suddenly transported from 1916 to 2015, what would he think? So, he'd probably have a little bit of shock, but he'd get over it, I imagine. Um, he was a pragmatist, as can be seen, by accepting his fate. He would have accepted the Earl that was here. At least it was the decisions were made by free people and not by others. But I imagine he would have been shocked by certain things, okay? But it's the context of a hundred years later. And I think, you know, if you transport them saying she must be Catholic and keep her faith, put that in the context now of a revisionist trying to judge a hundred years ago by the way they feel now. That's just as stupid as trying to judge what Michael would say if he came a hundred years forward immediately. It just doesn't fit. You can't do that. You have to treat the past as it was, a moment in time. And that's what Michael was. He was a man of his time. And of his time, everybody was Catholic. It ruled your life. Okay? And he couldn't imagine a world where, where Catholicism wouldn't be the ruling agenda of the day. But he would have also been accepted being a pragmatist that times change. So, one other thing about revisionism. And this is something I've done a little bit of research on. So, and it came from something Father Joe said to me. And I found this slide, and revisionism, a coup d'etat at Seville, d'etat at Seville, and my, we used to call her Auntie Una. It was Una, uh, Joe's sister, Michael's daughter. 1936. So, in 1934, uh, uh, I think it was 34, the Republicans uh, came, came to, you know, the, the Popular Front, which who were Republicans, came to power in Spain on the back of a popular vote. And we all know what happened after that. Franco rebelled. Uh, the reactionaries took back over Spain and imposed a rule of terror until the mid-70s. So you've got the white terror and you've got the red terror. The Red Terror was what happened uh, when the communists, Repu communist Republicans executed prisoners. The Red Terror, uh, and academic, academic research has shown this, uh, wasn't particularly planned. Usually it was when something had happened, they took somebody out and just shot them in, uh, just like those British soldiers that treated the, the Republicans badly after 1916, the communists just took out people and just shot them out of, out of pure passionate anger at a moment in time. And that's research has shown that. So the Red Terror, the Red Terror killed 408, 480 people uh, in and around uh, the Seville district, the broader district of, of which Seville is the, uh, the capital. The White Terror, which came in later after the rebellion by Franco, killed 8,000 people in the same area. And this was on a planned basis. It was a genocide. It was the murdering of all, all possible political opponents uh, including the poet Lorca and many others. And this was just in the Seville area. So, at that time, Una was in the convent in Seville. Uh, and the communists took over. And believe me, they had no time for the Catholic Church. Uh, they took out priests and shot them, especially ones who were, who were close to local landowners and local businessmen. They also took the landowners and businessmen out and shot them. Um, usually, when they rose up, as the local collectives, they got armed, they rose up. They dragged them out of their houses after years of oppression and being treated terribly, just like the workers in Dublin in 1913. But in Spain they had guns and they shot their oppressors on the spot. And this was the Red Terror. So Una at that time, there's, there's not too many records of nuns being shot, but there were thousands of priests shot. They were murdered, and uh, a lot of them have been murdered and made, made saints. Pope John Paul II uh, was the main pope that made saints from the, the Spanish martyrs. But Una lived through this, and uh, the main part of the, uh, the rebellion started in and around Seville. Troops came over, loyal to Franco uh, and his cohorts came over from Morocco. Uh, a lot of them were Arab troops, um, uh, you know, conscripted into the, the colonial army up there, and also Spanish foreign legionaries. Um, the Spanish had a foreign legion just like the French did. They were left free in the city of Seville. They were left free in other towns around there. Uh, once they'd been taken over by the Francos, the army in the town came over to the, the rebellion straight away. And they, they literally uh, raped, murdered, uh, usually with knives, the legionaries, uh, every man they could find, and raped every woman they could find. Didn't care what their political background was, they were left free in the city for a night. This was what the Roman legions used to do when they took a town that stood up against them. Uh, they let the army go free, 
do whatever you want, rob whatever you want, kill whoever you want, rape whoever you want. Uh, and that was a lesson. That was to be used as a lesson to the people if you rise up. If you do something we, the ruling class, don't like, like vote for Republicans, this is what's going to happen to you. We want to live through all this. Um, and what's her position? Her father was uh, a Republican socialist revolutionary. The church was under threat from Republican socialist revolutionaries in Spain, right? Joe would have been very sympathetic to her, to her position and the position of the, the Catholic orders out there. Uh, yet his, his comrades and people who had fought with Michael were out fighting on the Republican side in Spain. Um, and Joe was caught in the middle and Una was caught in the middle, in the middle of all this. So this comes back to revisionism and people being off their time. Here's two children whose father has died for the Republican Revolutionary Socialist cause who are now liable to be shot by the Republican Revolutionary Socialist cause because of what they did at their father's wishes, becoming members of, of religious orders. And this is where revisionism gets turned on its head. And you start finding that the people are just people and they have their own lives and everything is of its time. Revisionism is a lot of crap. I'm sorry, it really is. You cannot judge people from the, this distance. You cannot judge the people that did these things. You can say that they were animals, but they were of their time. That's what people did. But revisionism sells books. Absolutely. That's what it's yep. about. Newspapers and books. The Newspapers and books. in this world yeah. most people do. Create a controversy, people yeah. wait to see what it's all about. Yeah. Okay? And the fact is, it's not just bad publicity, it's all about yeah. publicity. So that whole Spanish it's incident. It's not just about publicity, you have to look at it. Uh, there's loads of historians around. Why do particular historians get uh, promoted? Mm. Uh, for instance, uh, that woman, what's her name? Um, famous among, uh, so famous I can't remember her name, but <laughs> famous among uh, 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 revisionist historians. She's always been put up. Uh, Ruth, Ruth Dolly Edwards? That's the one. Mm. And, and she had, has actually very little uh, historical knowledge. And any time she goes up against any historian, she goes to, uh, to take another line, she goes torn to bits. Yeah. On, the, on the stuff she does. That's right. So it's not, it's not about uh, controversy, I think, the, the reason that they get it up. It's because they push a particular political line that suits the state. Mm. That's why they I, get there's, there is a, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. It's a whole combination of things. This suits a lot of people to have things this way. So, Michael's place in history. It's open to discussion, okay? Uh, he was obviously a great leader. He obviously gave his life and helped make his country free. Uh, I, I don't think that his place in history has really been settled yet. To me, his, his appeal, knowing what he went through, is really as a man and as a human being, based on my own life experience, what must he have gone through. So that's his real appeal to me. I think he's a real man of the people. I think he's a, a man of the masses. Somebody should try, that people should try to emulate in the way he lived his life. His self-discipline, his dedication to whatever he did, both to his family and to his cause. He had more to lose than anyone else in the leadership at the time. So, yes, someone who did have small kids as well, one or two of them. But they came from middle class backgrounds. They knew their family had been looked after. This comes back to the stuff I showed earlier about what happened to his family and the struggles they had after he died without him there to support them. There wasn't a state to support them the way there is a state to support people now. He had a child on the way, he had four children. You know, they were probably going to lose Emma Road because he was dead. He only got it because of his job leaving the union. He had more to lose, but he did it anyway. He knew what he had to lose, and he still did it, because he thought it was the right thing to do. So to me, that's his place in history, as somebody that people should really emulate. You can talk about poetry, you can talk about rivers of blood, you know, soaking the ground and spring up new republics and all that. But to me, he is the man that really describes best ways of life, what this really meant. He wasn't a dreamer. He wasn't somebody that was up there, you know, thinking of Cucullin and green flags and all that stuff. He was an absolute pragmatist and a realist, and he's the type of man that we need in Ireland. And uh, I use this photograph because uh, you're looking at my son. He's the absolute image. This is my son, this picture. And to me, that brings it home more than anything, that this is a family member of mine, of whom I'm really proud. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, question and answer is that was a brilliant talk there by Noel. Uh, but
Well, if anybody would like to uh, put any questions to Noel or his family members or about Michael or Alan about their opinion, please walk away. I'd just like to say, Noel, I think he was very much aided, aided and abetted by his wife. Yes. His yeah. wife had all of those traits that uh, have probably influenced him considerably, yeah. coming from her father. And stuff yeah. like that. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, yeah. And she, she's a very much a forgotten part of, of yeah. Michael. Uh, yeah, well, as you can see, because she's she's living adjacent to me, well, not living, she's yeah. residing adjacent yeah. to me now, I don't feel yeah. 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 I hear her probably once a week. Yeah. 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 Uh, when the volunteers were walking through Dublin, I think it was after the revolution, uh, the people actually spat on them. Well, they did, yeah. They did. And yeah. they, did, they yeah. didn't want them to have done no. what they did. No, what you're talking about there is what were called the shawlies, right? They, they, the ground, they lived in the tenements and they had shawls. Uh, and they were called shawlies and they were, uh, they weren't, you, you couldn't even describe them as working class. Yeah. Their, their, uh, their men had joined the British Army to take the king's shilling, if you like. Yeah. Um, it was about the money because they couldn't earn a living. They didn't have skills. They weren't tradesmen. Um, and so they were, they, were the, they were the working class, but they were even a, a subclass to that. They had no education. They probably never went to school. They didn't know what was going on around them. Um, the, all they knew was that their husbands were abroad fighting and sending home money for them. And they That's saw their, their husbands were abroad fighting on the Western Front. Right. And all they, saw, money. They, were money. they were getting the money back from the government, and all they saw was that the Republicans were a threat to the uh, status quo, which meant that they wouldn't get their money. Right. So they spat at them, they threw rotten vegetables at them, and I'm sure there was a lot of um, right. pro-British people anyway, right. in the middle classes, that would have been quite happy right. to do the same thing. But the situation got turned on its head because of Bloody Maxwell and his ham-fisted approach to dealing with the aftermath by executing the leaders, spaced out over a period of a couple of weeks, uh, the pain of it going on, the shots being heard around Dublin as they executed them, changed the people's opinion. So that by 1918, Sinn Féin won two thirds of the seats in the general election, in the British general election, on the platform of having an Irish government. So that's when it all changed. 1916 changed everything. Yes. Yes. And the Shawleys were on the side by then. I'm a sister of charity, and one of our sisters, um, her brother was. Um, but it was one of us in 1916, mm. anyway. And she was in her room, and she knew when he was going to be executed, and she heard the shot. Mm. Yeah, it was very terrible. Terrible, terrible. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you another anecdote from the time. Um, my grandmother, um, Sarah, Tom, obviously was her father, uh, Tom Mellon. Um, the house was raided by the auxiliaries and the British Army uh, one morning. Yeah. Um, she was very small, and she was actually going out to school at the time. Yeah. Uh, just ready to go to school with her brothers. Yeah. Uh, they raided the house, uh, they pistol whipped her mother, um, uh, very cruelly, uh, yeah. asking where Tom was. Tom had gone over the back wall, uh, but before he went, he'd put his Luger pistol and two Mills bombs into my grandmother's oh. school bag, so yeah. they wouldn't be found, because he knew they wouldn't search uh, a female child. So she walked out of the house past them, and as she walked out, a British officer in a trench coat, she describes her very well, in a trench coat, and beautiful shiny boots, um, and a Sam Brown belt, uh, and she said he was the better sort of officer. He came in, and he pushed the auxiliary away, and said, don't touch that woman, and he apologised, and he gave Turkish delights, and she said they were in the same purple wrapper, it was paper then, yeah. uh, to the three children. Now, two of the children threw their Turkish delights in the Kamak River, uh, as they were on the way to school. Uh, the third one ate his and discovered that it wasn't poisoned after all. <laughs> climbed into the river on the way home and got the other two and ate it. <laughs> Where was this place? Uh, they lived in Dolphins Burn. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's another little anecdote. Yeah. 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 My family were very much involved. Um, I believe uh, my father was uh, one of the 1960 men, one of the volunteers, and this, it was such a secret society. Mm. That his brother was in it too, and neither of them neither knew about it. Yeah. 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 And on, on the day, the morning of the rising, uh, Daddy disappeared, but he wasn't there. And his mother was very, she kind of felt she knew where he was, but she wasn't sure. And neither was his brother. Anyway, he, but Dad was sent over to, uh, whatever I told you, um, Knutsford. Mm. And uh, 
at the time, the Catholic Church in Ireland did not approve at all oh, of no. the Rising. Not at all. And no. now my dad and his no, wife was quite young, and when they arrived, when they were when they, they got to Nutsford, they were stripped naked um, to drag down stone steps and hosed with cold water and left there. Yep. So my dad developed pneumonia. Yeah. And um, he thought himself he was dying. And that they had been ipso facto excommunicated by the church. And dad said that he reasoned it out with himself. He said, I have not done anything against God, mm. so I'm not accepting this yeah. thing that they're saying. And he asked for a priest. And he was fortunate that the, his guard got him a priest. I don't know what he, I don't mm. know what he was in order or what, but anyway, he came in. And the, the, the guard is on duty in the room, with, in the cell with him. And uh, he went through his, he made his, he thought he was dying, mm. so he gave him the last rites. Mm. And after the confession, he very um, gently pulled down, you know the way men used to have the big cufflinks, mm. and the big, so he pulled it down, and he whispered to dad in his ear, does your mother know where you are? And he said, no. And he said, would you like me to let her know? And he said, yes. So he gave her, him, his address. Yeah. And that's how she got to know. Yeah, that he, that's where he was. It's a fabulous story. Is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, but that's true. What was yeah. your father's name? William McGinley. William McGinley. Yeah. Yeah. I have to yeah. The Irish volunteers. Oh, Irish. Oh, yeah. yeah, the people. Yeah, the gentleman was away. No, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. And he was in the post office. <laughs> When I said that recently to somebody, somebody had said that there were 500 people in the post office. I can't understand. I can't believe that. No, no. Everybody in Dublin was in the post office. 400. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the lady there just uh, raised an interesting point about the Catholic Church. And this is uh, something I've always found difficult to understand. Why the Republican movement? Uh, because republicanism, if you think about it, as an ideology, yeah. first came up for the separation of church and state. That's in France. Like the yeah. French Revolution yeah. was very anti uh, the Catholic Church. Um, and the Irish, uh, the, the first republicans in, in Ireland, well, apart from Cromwell and so on, the first uh, republicans on the Irish side were Presbyterians uh, and, and, and right. Anglicans. Yeah. So why? Why do you think that uh, the Republican movement, and, and we can see its influence there on the Simpson Army as well, yeah. Connolly a Catholic, yeah. Madden a Catholic? Uh, Connolly was a kind of quasi-Catholic. He, yeah, he, 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 he took confession at the end. He took confession he didn't attend church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, and his wife converted to Catholicism yeah. as well, did he? But why the church, uh, the Catholic church leadership, from the time it got legalized and the Royal College of Maynooth, was always against uh, the Republican movement. And mm. always against. Uh, I mean, yeah. there's individuals you can always say did different things, yeah. but the church hierarchy was yeah. always against what, what, what it. And see, even even uh, years afterwards, has stood against any social reform or anything else. That yeah, was going no, on. Uh, uh, agreed. And it takes different positions in different countries. That's what the present pope is very interesting because he's a kind of a reform theologian. You know, he 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 stands for the people. Um, let's see where it goes. You know. But I think if you look at the church from history, in every country that the Catholic Church exists in, they tend to side with the establishment. And this isn't because they believe the establishment views, it's because they want to survive. They go with the side that they think is going to survive. They want to survive. Or they'll be allowed to prosper yeah, as, a, as a church and as a religion. They tend to do, to do that uh, on the reactionary side of the church. But especially if you look at Central and South America in the last 50 years, 100 years, uh, they're very much on the side of the people. Uh, it's all about reform theology. Uh, Archbishop Romero, uh, was murdered by right wing reactionaries. Uh, but he was an exception. Actions. And some was committed with targets. There were exceptions. But anyway, there's been no final analysis about yeah. Ireland yeah. and the history of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Why yeah. is the Republican movement uh, so, uh, have yeah. been so I, uh, supportive of the I, 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 I can't answer the question. I would say now the Republican movement isn't very supportive of the Church, quite the opposite. But I'll give you a couple of examples from, from War of Independence about the uh, ambivalence. Uh, or the lack of ambivalence that revolutionary show for the church, and it goes to your point. Uh, on the night before the Kilmichael ambush, uh, Tom Barry brought in a priest, uh, and uh, there was mass said and confession given to every member of the column that was going out to fight the, the British the next day. And the, the priest, they had mass, and then the priest actually asked Tom, uh, are you going to be fighting the British tomorrow? And he said, yes. So with that, he, he said to all the boys who wanted confession, come and get confession. And he never said a word, he kept it to himself, and it was a very successful ambush and changed the course, the direction of the War of Independence. The other example I would give you is in 
uh, the Gypsy Ambush uh, in East Cork, uh, sometimes called the Coachford Ambush. And at that, the, the, uh, the column was lined up to ambush uh, a, a British column that they knew would be coming along using the road. They were given away uh, by uh, a Catholic priest. He came through the ambush. They let him through, but he obviously saw them. He went and told a lady, uh, Mrs. Lindsay, who was a, a, an Anglo landowner at the time, uh, that the boys were out there. Knowing when he told her that she would tell the British, which she did, and, uh, and a counter ambush was launched, the IRA lost men, um, uh, but, but the leaders escaped. Uh, they then came back a little while later. They knew the priest had given them away. They didn't touch the priest. They took out Mrs. Lindsay and shot her and buried her. Oh, her God. Right? So she did what she was programmed to do. The priest, on the other hand, was the absolute opposite of the priest in West Cork. He gave them away. But the column still let him live because he was a priest. And this is this lack of ambivalence, as I'm saying, towards yeah. the church. No matter what the church did, whether it was for them or against them, they weren't going to touch anybody right. in the church. Now, maybe that was because they were afraid it would turn the people against them. That actually, that story about Mrs. Lindsay had a, a, an addendum. Um, uh, the leader of the group that, uh, that shot Mrs. Lindsay um, obviously became a very wanted man by the British. Um, they raided his house, and a one armed officer, obviously lost his arm in the first war, pushed his mother down the stairs. And I'm not sure if he killed or broke her back, but she was either crippled or killed. Uh, uh, and and that, that was the times, so it was very rough. And during the truce, uh, and the treaty negotiations and, and that, um, this particular individual tracked down uh, the person who had done this, this one-armed officer, um, got drinking with him with another, a, a couple, of, couple of lads, got drinking with this man in a pub, uh, inveigled him into their confidence, and then they, this was down around Wexford, and they took him out and shot him by the side of the road. This was during the, tr the, the treaty. So that was personal revenge. 